topic of my talk is an article powered chemical registration in the fragrance and flavors industries. Now to the agenda, I'm going to start with the industry introduction. Then we'll have a look about on our legacy systems and why we needed the new system. Uh, I'm going to share some thoughts on data migration. I'm going to show you a screen capture of the registration process. And finally, I'm going to talk about the core system capabilities. And the uh, main topics will be topic one and topic five. And in between, I might go a bit faster in the sake of time. So on to the industry introduction. Uh, I work at Chivado and the company is organized into two divisions, fragrance and beauty and taste and well-being. And they're about of equal size in terms of sales. Now the company has a quite complex history of uh, acquisition, mergers, spin-off, and it means it's quite distributed all around the world. And there are also different research sites. So in case of system, we also need to take into account the needs of the users across different sites. So in case of the registration, it's sites in Europe, US, and in China. Now to a comparison between the two divisions. So on the taste and well-being side, you have a flavor. The flavor goes, goes into a drink or a food, and then you ingest it. On the fragrance side, you have a perfume, shower gel, uh, maybe a liquid detergent, and uh, that might have contact with your skin, but you're not ingesting it. And that means you have different regulations on the two sides. On the taste and well-being side, it's a little bit more involved to introduce new synthetic molecules. And on the fragrance and beauty side, it's a standard course to introduce new safe synthetic molecules. Uh, on the taste and well-being side, salts play a role. While on the fragrance side, they don't play a role at all because they're not volatile, so they don't smell. And now, important part is that mixtures play a role in both divisions. Uh, simple and complex mixture. In this case, it's more about simple mixture, which we need to be able to handle in a chemical registration system. So, for example, you have a natural product, which itself is already a mixture. You do a reaction with it. Output is obviously also a mixture, and you need to somehow be able to deal with it. And uh, then on the taste and well-being side, you might need regulatory approval before you can taste something, a new molecule or compound. While on the fragrance and beauty side, uh, it's much easier. You basically can do your reaction, and then you can smell it, and you might know if it's good or not. Simplified. Yeah, you have to record it. Then. It's a human, yeah, okay. If you see this, it's a human essay. And now often we talk about small molecules. In case of fragrance, we're talking about very small molecules. So we have three examples here, very small. Usually they have just one functional group. And now, since I'm based in Zurich, I took the opportunity and brought three samples along, which we can now smell. They're now getting distributed. And maybe to explain the, the strips, they have a, a color coding on them. So the, the pink one is nymphiol, it's a floral mugia note. The one that is not marked, just the strip in white, is a umbretolite, it's a macrocyclic mask. <laughs> And the, yeah, the, the one marked in yellow is Amprofix. This is an ambery note. Maybe comment on ambery. Some people are not mixed with, so they don't smell it. So if you don't smell the yellow one, it's it's normal. Don't be afraid. And now they're getting distributed, and I will, in the meantime, continue with my presentation. Yeah. So to the history. Our old application was a commercial product uh, called Cambiopis Enterprise from Cambridge Soft. And uh, Cambridge Soft was later purchased by Perkin Elm and they now have spun off as Revity. And this old product was based on active server pages, something from the 90s. <laughs> yes. And uh, the, the web page uh, only did play correctly in Internet Explorer 6 according to uh, compatibility mode in MSH. 
Additionally, you always had to have CamDraw installed locally on your laptop that the structured display works. So you had to take care of the distribution of this. And every time you update the CamDraw, certain provisions had to be made on the server. And this was a, a maintenance nightmare. Additionally, the system uh, connected to an Oracle 10G database, which is also very old and outdated, and in that case, also very costly. Now, in terms of uh, the software itself, the system also had some big limitations. Uh, most notably, there was no way to validate the chemical structures. So any valid chem drawing could be entered by the user saved and there was no guarantee you would be able to ever find it again with a structure search. And there was also no possibility to control the chem draw style, so the, the bond lengths, the label sizes, and all that stuff. So whatever the user preferred, he could use and save. And this sometimes led to a lot of issues downstream with small files, bond lengths, and when you tried to render the images, they were way too big or too small. So it was always kind of a pain. The system also had limitations in terms of uh, privileges. They weren't very fine-grained. That means uh, often administrators need to do simple tasks like updating or things like that. And there was also no tracking of changes. And the system was monolithic. Uh, there was no uh, endpoint to integrate with it. And this essentially meant there's a lot of copy-paste going on also for registration from the ELM. And this was also a very big pain point. And now the database tended to be kind of slow in regards to the chemical structure. So when you wanted to read them out, it was very slow. And there could be issues with the format conversions, which also wasn't very helpful at times. Now some thoughts on data migration. Uh, here, uh, importantly, you need to reserve enough time and cost for this because it can get quite complex. Of course, the complexity depends on how big the change is. In our case, the changes were quite big. And what we wanted to do most importantly was to, to normalize uh, the structures to one chem draw style and also convert from CDX to CDXML. And of course, when you do that, you need to have certain uh, validation code in place to assess that you're not doing something wrong with all the structures. On top of that, we needed to convert to a MOL file so that the order kit can read it because, and at that point, the CDXML part was not really available yet or not good enough to be usable, I would say. We also had to do preparation for the mixture handling. And in essence, the main point also was to have as many structures valid for the order kit as possible. And in some cases, this also meant a manual cleaning of problematic drawings. And in some cases, we knew that beforehand. In some cases, iterations of the data migration found some problems. And uh, that workflow can always be distributed among multiple people. I mean, it's a balance if you want to automate it. But if you automate it, you need to also again, have an automated validation of the changes. So manual might be faster in some cases. And we're talking here about maybe hundreds of structures, so not thousands or tens of thousands. So manual work is, is, is feasible. And this is just an example of, of drawings we had, which we had to manually fix. Mm -hmm. Now to the registration process. So uh, this is a screenshot for context and if the video that follows doesn't work. So the process starts in the ELM signals notebook. Uh, many of you probably know that. And from there, the user can trigger the registration with an external action, which then opens a new browser tab with the registration system. And now we're gonna start the screen capture. Right, so we are in signals notebook. We can go to the sample and trigger an external action, register to CAMREG. A new tab opens, and now the data gets pulled in from Signal's notebook. Uh, the user can start filling out the needed information. 
a lot of it is optional. If more data is in SQL so notebook, that would also get pulled in. Now, uh, the, the fragment analysis is shown. I will talk about this later. And then we can submit. Now this triggers the duplicate check intentionally. In this case, it's an exact duplicate. So we would just add a new batch to it. Uh, just I'm just showing here the other option, which the user could choose in case he thinks it's not a duplicate and you want to register a new compound. So now we add a batch. In the background, data is being now sent again to Signals Notebook via API calls, which can take some time. We can now go to the new record. And in the new record, we can link back to the notebook so we can click on it. Then we'll be back to the experiment. And if we scroll down to the sample, we now see that the registration number has been transferred to the sample. So now the systems are linked. You can go from the notebook to the registration or the registration to the notebook just with clicking. And before often you try copy pasting uh, IDs and things like that. So that's why it's uh, very nice for the user. Now to the core system capabilities. I would say the most important part of this talk. So about the chemical structures, and we use the original drawing from Signals Notebook, which is the, is CDXML, and this is stored and used for display. And when I mean for display, the CDXML is used to render an SVG image, which is then actually displayed. Also, it gets then converted to a mole file, which we then use to build the article molecule which then is used for the indexing. Also, we take the inchy and flat inchy. So flat inchy means no stereochemistry with the S non-flag. And these are used for lookups. And in case we cannot generate an inchy from the article molecule, we use canonical smiles. And examples for that are molecules with data fonts. Now, maybe to add, why aren't we using the registration hash? Uh, when we started this project, I think it was just the first version and there was a minor issue for us, which made it not possible to use it. So we went with this way. And in case of our molecules, as you have seen before, it works well enough. Also molecules that can not be converted to a valid articate molecule, they can still be registered and displayed, but you cannot search them by chemical structure. And, uh, this feature is hidden behind a special privilege. So only selected users can actually do it on the base of need, because we want, of course, want to limit as much as possible uh, invalid structures. Now to the mixture handling. Uh, the old system, it had its positive. So a nice feature was that if you registered something with two or more components and you did a full structure search, uh, it would find everything that contained what you draw as a single component. So only one component needed to match. And uh, with Articate, uh, be it in the cartridge or Articate itself, if you have an Articate molecule and you do a full structure search, all the components must match. And since this feature was kind of important, we had to do according uh, provisions in the database design. So what happens now when you register a mixture, so two or more components in the back end, it, it gets split up into the, its individual components. And then the search actually happens on these uh, individual components. So it's basically a many to many relationship between compounds and molecules or compounds and components. Uh, so what we saw in the screen capture before is the fragment analysis. So by default, the system takes the molecular weight and formula of the heaviest component in case we have multiple structures entered. Now the user can override this in the fragment analysis and select the main molecule. And then the molecular weight and molecular formula of this main molecule will be used for display. Also, we have a treat as entity option. If you select that, the combined molecular weight and form of use of all the drawn structures. And this, of course, then brings us to salts. So there is no salt splitting in the system. 
and by default salts are treated as entity so the combined molecular rate is used now why do we handle it this way very simple because both ions matter for the taste so they might go different routes in the evaluation process and therefore need a different registration number. The stereochemistry, of course, it may matter greatly for the activity of your molecule. And there are extreme examples where two enantiomers smell completely differently. But uh, this is rather the exception than the rule. Mostly they smell the same one of them is just a little bit weaker than the other one and thereby they don't really impact each other so you don't need to separate them to get a clean smell also you can uh, sell mixtures to the market and in combination this means there is a limited importance to have stereochemistry clean products when you register them also when you register them uh, we have limited information available around stereochemistry. Mostly it's what you know from the raw material. So is the raw material pure or not? And is your reaction selective or not? And that's the, where the information mostly comes from. And this impacts how we record stereochemistry, how the duplicate checking works, and the search behavior. So how do we track the stereochemistry information? I can start that we do not use enhanced stereochemistry. It was deemed too complex. And uh, it was one of the few points the chemists quickly and immediately agreed upon that we don't use it. Uh, so how do we track it then? We track it by the drawing in certain drawing rules, by the chemical name, by a set of checkboxes, and also by a free text common. And so in this example, what we want to highlight here is that we really want to register the molecule as chrome. So we see it by the name, the stereochemistry. We say it's a single diastereomer, a single enantiomer, and not any mixture of any other kind. So it's really what we draw. In other cases, you might have a, a more complex mixture, and then you can use a text comment where you even specify ratios. And this uh, ratios happens in, in free text. We had some discussions to have this more structured. But in the end, you actually never search for this information. You always search for the structure or maybe registration number. And so it's it's easier to have it in, uh, in free text and in a more structured fashion. Now to the duplicate checking. I call this fuzzy, and this was actually re uh, requested by the chemists to work this way. So the goal is to avoid duplicates as much as possible, and let the expert choose and not the system trying to be very smart. And how it works is on the left-hand side, we have a new molecule we want to register. The system now sees that one component of this existing entry matches, ignoring stereochemistry. And now the user has a choice. He can go to the to the drop down here, which we saw before. There are different options available. He can select uh, only one component matches. It's a different mixture, and then he can add a new entry, and he gets a new number. Or maybe the chemist thinks, okay, indeed, I was a bit lazy. I didn't do it correctly, and I forgot the minor constituent, which only appears ten percent. So, system, you're right. I'm going to add a new batch to it, and then he can add a batch. And that's kind of the logic of how this is supposed to work. And uh, I mean, the chemical space is big. We don't get that many accidental triggers like this. So it's not a big burden to maybe have to add, uh, select something in a drop down and register it again. It doesn't happen that often in reality. So it's fine enough that it's a bit fuzzy. Structure searching. So we use a default substructure search from the RD kit. It's configured to best mimic the old system. Uh, full structure search is using the in series out stereochemistry. This is exactly how the duplicate check works. The exact structure uh, works the same, except that stereochemistry is now taken into account. And for advanced users, we have the advanced substructure search, which exposes the different adjust query properties from RD kit. 
which then can be used for potentially more fine-grained searches. So takeaway and conclusions. You can absolutely use the Arctic kit to build a chemical registration system. <laughs> uh, However, how you implement it, of course, depends on the needs of your specific industry. Uh, you should not underestimate the data migration. It's likely we'll need multiple iterations to do it. And uh, therefore, it's very advised to have automation things in place for validation of the migration. Now, how you handle stereochemistry, duplicate checking, and other cheminformatics tasks is not only a technical problem. You will have a lot of different opinions. And at some point, you need to come to a joint decision on how you want to do it. For example, in the stereochemistry, depending on the system, what you have before and what you have new, there is some data migration involved. And at some point, you need to fix that. Else, if you change it again, you have to redo the data migration and retest it. And that can be a bit problematic that you get in a circle, but that's, all, that's why you need to fix it at some point. But the users are extremely happy with the new system. They're linked together. Uh, they don't need to contact administrators for changes. And most importantly, there is no more copy paste needed for them. So thank you for your attention.